Um, with that, let's get started. Please help me welcome Chris Kobeka. All right, hello, welcome everyone. If everyone can hear me, hopefully this thing stays in my ear and doesn't get, well, dropped off. So, welcome to How to Start a Cyber War, lessons from the European Union. And this talk is actually about last year's cyber warfare exercises involving the European Union and NATO that I helped lead in Brussels. Uh, just a brief introduction, there's lots of words, basically. I kind of like to watch the world burn a little bit and have a fun doing so. Uh, in a somewhat responsible way. Now, you might want to ask the question why the topic of cyber war and why it's so important to do some of these different types of exercises. Now, in Europe, you may not be aware, but we've already had one very major cyber warfare event that happened in 2007 in the country of Estonia. Now, at the time, Estonia was a NATO member, which I like to point out, and now NATO has set up their cyber center of excellence in Estonia as a show of force. Basically what had happened, there was an old Soviet uh, soldier monument that was being moved in Estonia and suddenly there was a massive DDoS attack which tried to shut down the country of Estonia in 2007, launched by supposedly patriotic Russian hackers. Uh, and Georgia also suffered major cyber warfare events as Russian troops were moving into parts of Georgia. South Korea, North Korea just doesn't like them, but we'll see what happens. In the long run, um, we had a Stuxnet uh, issue uh, with Iran that uh, involved critical infrastructure and nuclear enrichment facilities. Um, Saudi Ramco, this is one of my favorite pictures, these are miles and miles of gasoline trucks. And what had happened was they were the victim of a cyber warfare attack by the Iranians, and the Iranians were able to shut down basically all of the IT infrastructure for the world's most valuable company. Now, who thinks that Apple is the world's most valuable company? Yeah, it doesn't compare. So uh, Saudi Ramco is worth about 18 to 20 trillion dollars. And that's almost 10 times the GDP of India. Um, after that, they've been having ongoing attacks. They were not able to fuel the country after 13 days, their strategic supply was gone. So if you called an ambulance, you might not get it. The supply chain was broken. And then we have from 2012 to still ongoing attacks occurring in the Ukraine, and especially in pre-Crimea, about six months before there were any supposed maybe Russian boots on the ground, there was an attack that uh, occurred only in the Crimea region, attacking smart TVs, forcing the channel to be changed to propaganda television and rebel TV, as staging it for positive support before any boots were on the ground. And many different types of attacks are ongoing. Uh, so we've got a lot of challenges in the European Union and for NATO. Um, one of them definitely is Russia and what's been going on with Russia. Uh, the relationship with the United States itself has been an extreme challenge, to say the least. Uh, China, they have a completely different set of ethics and rules when it comes to testing, breaking, or doing whatever, or say leaking or taking data, we'll just say that. Uh, we've got the rise of popularism in politics all throughout the European Union, which could be a good thing. Probably not. If you look back at history from the last century, it probably won't be a good thing. So we're seeing. Uh, immigration amongst the member states and also uh, external immigration is a big problem. Trying to integrate. We don't all talk the same language. We don't all have the same system. But we're supposed to be sort of like a federation of countries uh, inside our European Union. And it's a big challenge. It's a huge challenge. And then we also have foreign and internal interference because not everybody's actually best friends, best buds in the European Union, right? And they also have various relationships with, say, China or Russia, especially if you're talking about countries like Bulgaria. They've got a completely different relationship than, say, the United Kingdom. So last year, uh, we had this uh, great idea, um, thanks to the European Council on Foreign Relations, 
they ran a series of exercises in Brussels and wanted to really shake some things up and use realistic scenarios. So we went ahead and worked on some very, very interesting stuff, and I hope you'll enjoy. We had a bunch of ministers, uh, people like what would be the equivalent of the Secretary of State of the United States were there. We had ambassadors, think tank people, all sorts of different types of people. And mainly people who would make decisions in case of an actual war or who would assist with expert advisement were present. So to get them warmed up, I led the exercises by just showing them some pretty pictures because diplomats need a lot of pictures and not a lot of words. So some of the things I showed them on this list, this is a power plant that is infected by remote access Trojan. Uh, the same remote access Trojan uh, was also on this salmon farm uh, and also on a bank called ABM Bank, which was government funded from the Netherlands. All three cases that I showed the diplomats, they were controlled by the same entity behind Vimple ISP in Russia. Same exact remote access Trojan as well. And then I also like to have fun with things. Um, how to find legal and illegal grow operations. If you have a grow tent and it's connected to the internet, that's all I'm saying. So a toolkit was built for these ministers and diplomats because this is kind of a new area to consider. We have already playbooks, what happens if somebody invades your country? But we don't really have a huge amount of playbooks for what happens if somebody gets into your hospital infrastructure or makes a mistake while they're testing. Uh, in the Netherlands, it was the first country ever that legalized the ability to hack back into any device anywhere in the world by the Dutch police. So if they sus suspect you of something, or me, they could actually hit your phone here today. Great, right? Uh, they also have a, a weird quirk in the law. If you're caught hacking for the good of humanity, it's not illegal. <laughs> And not everybody is a nuclear power in Europe, and one particular country, I can't say which, is, but will not admit it. So there's a whole big mix of people in their capacity for uh, uh, the appropriate response, depending on what is occurring. So we had three main scenarios to warm them up all the way to the main one. Clean slate was a very interesting one. Uh, little man, uh, involved some hacking back into intelligence agencies and back and forth, and Dead Canary, the big one, the funnest one, I like it, caused mass casualties across uh, various nations inside the EU. When we talk about clean slate, we tried to put a spin on it and do it in a different way for an insider threat. So the scenario was there was an embassy employee who was having uh, mental health issues. And he began taking documents from the embassy that were classified, highly classified, and hoarding them in his house. And he began hoarding. And what happened was he had had an adult daughter in the scenario who happened to uh, belong to a particular uh, forum for karma, who was posting some of these documents. Someone from 4chan picked up that they were classified and disseminated them further, and obviously, once it's on the internet, it's not coming off the internet. I think we all know that by now, right? And it was a very different way of looking at it, on top of which, um, the laptop that she was using was, in turn, infected with a rat, not by an intelligence agency, but uh, just a regular cybercrime, and they also got a copy of all of the classified documents that hadn't been uploaded yet. So I also wrote a note, another reason why I did not have children uh, on the bottom of it. <laughs> so oh, Little Man is uh, interesting as well. There is a security researcher who is trying to s responsibly disclose a critical major vulnerability with proof of concept, exploit code, already testing. And the security researcher runs into problems, and this is a problem within the European Union responsible disclosure. Not all of the uh, CERT teams uh, actually have the capability to deal with them correctly. 
So then the researcher gets a group of researchers to try to put pressure on that particular government to accept this because it's a major issue. In the meantime, unfortunately, the way that they were trying to responsibly disclose, they did not encrypt the information. So there was an intelligence agency that was listening in and found, hey, you didn't encrypt that email that you were telling me, here's a vulnerability, here's how you can get it, and here's some proof of code concept, uh, code. And so they were able to uh, surveil, figure out, and get the information without doing any work. Right? And in between, they found that uh, at the time, there were shadow broker subscriptions, and they were also had to make the decision if they would purchase a subscription. And they were given information that several other countries had already purchased subscriptions. And the whole idea is, what do you do if uh, countries have access to this and are subscribers and are not very friendly to you and have attacked you before, should you also buy the subscription so that you're on equal footing? Right? But then again, is it actually legal to do so? Right? What would happen if the press found out? On top of which, uh, the exploit code and some of the shadow broker stuff was used against a particular intelligence agency, a different one, and data was stolen. In the meantime, the uh, scenario, because there's only one country that is allowed to hack back, the Dutch mistakenly in the scenario hacked a foreign government's hospital system and um, had to figure out how to notify them before they found out and cool it down and uh, figure out how to talk to diplomats and all sorts of things so that perhaps the ambassador of that country wouldn't be kicked out after it was found out that uh, the Dutch mistakenly um, hit a uh, foreign country. Whoops. Now, my favorite one, because it involves violence, is Dead Canary. And what we did was we made it so that it was a bit sh similar to the Shamoon attacks. So we staged a paste bin saying, you're going to be taken out with a bunch of different threats at a particular time and place, and we're going to destroy your systems. And what happened was it was staged and timed multiple attacks on different countries, and they hit various areas. So the telecom, government websites, banking, stock exchanges, all the way down to London Underground during rush hour. So we start in the evening, and it starts with one particular country basically getting DDoSed in a similar manner as Estonia did in 2007. Uh, the next morning, ICS systems, the Scottish systems, are attacked in a um, shipping lane, a water shipping lane, which causes a Maersk cargo ship to capsize, a killing or missing all of the sailors on board. Another country is hit with a nationwide electricity blackout and also transformers are taken out and there are mass transformer fires. At the same time, the telecommunications systems have already been affected so it's very hard to respond. Transformers can take up to 18 months to build. We're talking about a country where there are widespread transformer fires. 8.45 in the morning, London Underground, Someone gets into the signaling and is able to manipulate the signaling system, shut off the auto shutdown systems and all the rest of the safety systems, and is able to collide trains in the London Underground during rush hour, causing mass casualties. National Stock Exchange of another country is manipulated and crashed, bringing down their entire financial infrastructure. No more stocks are traded. The next day, I will briefly say a summary. Good morning, America. We have been made aware that five European Union countries, our allies, have come under attack and there are mass casualties. But when I visited the European Union and spoke to my allies, I warned them, I heeded them, and I told them that they needed to meet their spending 2% of the GDP, but they did not heed my warning. Now is the time for Europe to stand on its own two feet. American blood will not be spilled. We have put up our digital defense wall. I 
put that part in. And it's the biggest defense wall they didn't let me say that. <laughs> um, and good night and good bless uh, and God bless America. So what had happened was we had already anticipated that the United States would not assist in the case of a EU ally or a NATO ally coming under massive attack. Uh, why this is important is the first and last time that Article 5 of NATO was used was during the 9-11 attacks. And the Allies uh, gave a lot of additional help, a lot of ships, intelligence supports, and so forth. And the current situation with the European Union right now is we're basically surrounded by a ring of fire. We have a very terse and difficult relationship with the United States on one side, and we've got Russia on the other that's putting a huge amount of pressure. There's also been election manipulation inside the European Union, specifically France last year. And there's also been manipulation in Bulgaria uh, when they had their vote the same time frame. I actually went to Bulgaria the weekend before I was at OpenFest and I uh, showed them in Sofia, Bulgaria how to do OSINT on the um, hardliner that was running in Bulgaria that was very pro-Russian so they could find out as much information about them as possible before they went out and voted. Because I like to do that. Um, so it's rather Im important to think what would happen if some of our allies came under attack in that manner? What would you do? So it leaves us in a, a very odd situation. Now we're dealing with a lot of different countries at this event. Not everyone's friends, not everyone likes each other. Some do, some don't, some have different relationships. How many of you have experienced decision makers that cannot make a decision? Yes, 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 everybody, right? So some of the lessons that we learned were um, there were people who could not make a decision. There were people that did make a decision. Uh, there was one particular country, cannot mention it, on every single scenario, she just kept saying, sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. And I'm like, okay, all right, I get you. Let me guess. Sanctions, yes, sanctions. Right? Um, they could not always decide together, right? So we then had to do it by table and then switch the people to try to improve that relationship because it was difficult to make a decision, right? And um, it really was, and this should be worrisome, most of the teams could not come to a consensus in this scenario. And another thing was many of the countries were not prepared. And that was one of the things we were trying to drill into them. It really is not if, it will be when. Because we've already experienced issues and we will continue to experience issues. So with the United States. Now the night before, we did Dead Canary. I love Dead Canary. It's my favorite. Um, we made a bet amongst the staff to see if anybody could get our teams to agree to consider the nuclear option. I won. I was able to get my team to consider the use of a nuclear weapon as an EMP device to take out the foreign entity. I'm fun at parties. <laughs> so. I wanted to give a US audience a little bit of a taste of what we've been experiencing in the European Union and the EU NATO members and the things that we're prepared for, and the things that we expect. So big conclusion, we don't have solid definitions of what cyber warfare is yet. Not all countries agree to it. Uh, not every country has specific cyber laws, like Albania, small country. Um, hacking back sounds cool, but what if you get the wrong target and you cause a major international incident? Because it's pretty easy to mix up an IP address. I think we've all done that or I had friends who did something like that. And <clears throat> another thing I want to uh, stress is public disclosure is very dangerous. The reason being is if you hear in the news that uh, someone has disclosed an intelligence tool in a scenario, or excuse me, in real life, that means that all of the money that they put into developing that tool, they have now thrown away because they can't use that tool or the tool and technique combination again because now someone else will know about it. Um, not everybody likes each other. And right now, if we can't get a definition, 
we believe that the diplomatic route is probably the best before they listen to me about using an EMP device. Okay. <laughs> so that's what uh, we wanted to really get them ready for. So now I am ready for questions. And I want to thank you very much for attending my talk. So who has questions? I've got one here, one here, one there, yeah, there. No, wait, these, these ones. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So this is more of a comment just on the hacking back. Um, as some of us know, attribution is hard, and you know, that'd be a great way to say, oh, you know, let's make these people a target, make it look like it came from them. Well, that was one of the big decision factors, because how do you actually prove the whole attribution before you start to declare war? And we're talking about a war scenario. If somebody causes mass casualties through cyber attacks in your country, that is war. But how do you prove it? Uh, no, he had a question. Might want to kind of keep your your hands a little raised so that I can get them. There's one back there. Look who they on Muten. Look who they on Muten. Oh, nice to meet you. Uh, at what level were you simulating these events? Like, how how did you actually do the scenario? Well. What we did was we had uh, pre-staged, um, I don't know if this one has any in it, uh, different types of news items and then intelligence reports and then updates. On top of which we would have headlines and then I also showed real cases on top of it. And each one of them were able to talk to me as well to ask the questions and they were also given a glossary because not everybody knows all these terms, especially diplomats or ministers. And so we also talked them through the entire thing. So we used visual, but obviously not physical. So, yeah. And it worked out very well. All right, so we had another. Uh, yes, um, considering traditional warfare has got quite strict definitions of um, uh, code of conduct, um, do you s foresee that we'd need something similar for this new theater of warfare? And how long do you think it would take for that to well, actually, um, it's been referred to as the Digital Geneva Convention, and that is something that's been discussed. Last year, it was the UNGGE team, I believe it was, that was trying to negotiate that in the United Nations. Unfortunately, one particular country decided to just... <laughs> um, so there was actually no consensus, but they got extremely close. They got seven out of eight. So they're going to try again. Uh, we'll see, but it's already being discussed. Things like you cannot test in a hospital or medical areas or electrical or telecommunications. Uh, certain things like that carry different types of weights because they do in real life. Next question. Got one here. Hi, um, do you have any thoughts on the potentialities of false flag operations in cyber war? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, these types of things occur as part of whatever strategy the country happens to have. Um, they've occurred in the past, they will continue to occur, absolutely. Uh, I think that they occur on a fairly regular basis as well, depending on the country. Yeah. Uh, who were the uh, participants in this game? Are there were professionals? Yes, so they were uh, the ministers of defense. Okay. Uh, ambassador of, um, minister of war. So I have a question. So I was participating in a similar exercise here in the USA in, in Washington DC. We were simulating the escalation of conflict in Middle East. And surprisingly, so I'm a, I see a security profession, I mean, I'm security professional, so I'm not really in this political sciences or politics in general, but it was interesting that 
So you mentioned the situation that uh, people could not make decisions. So like, for example, in my simulation <laughs> game, uh, people were just like simply ordering assassina uh, assassinations. Did you have the same situation? Yes. And surprisingly, <laughs> you, you cannot even imagine how many, how many. Simple decision was always assassination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you had a tougher crowd. <laughs> so kind of along those lines. Yes. 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 So kind of. <laughs> so you mentioned that your group uh, was the only one that kind of went for the nuclear option. Yes. What was the uh, kind of average response that most of the other groups or tables had? Um, kind of the average response was uh, rebuking, removal of diplomats, public shaming. Uh, there was also uh, a few teams, a couple of teams that chose hiring um, hackers from their own country as patriotic hackers to hack back as a response for the countries where it was not legal to hack back, um, assassination, uh, sanctions, um, things of that nature, but yes. yes. <laughs> someone that uh, would, it would be someone that would basically make a statement, right? Uh, I'll uh, refer to, let's say, nuclear physicists in Iran keep getting shot up and killed by uh, two men on motorcycles. Um, so that's pretty regular. I think it happens maybe about once every month, two months. Oh, so I'm just saying. Um, the U.S. is fairly well isolated from, or the American public is fairly well isolated from feeling the effects of um, military action. Um, but when we're talking about cyber attacks, that might be one where a lot of Americans might be able to feel that firsthand. You show that line yes. of uh, gas trucks in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. Um, do you think, what do you think the impact of that would be on driving U.S. policy to engage in cyber attacks and um, being sort of a, accustomed to having those impacts felt here domestically? Well, luckily, the United States was the first country that established a computer emergency response team associated with Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they've actually been charting these things for over 20 years. Uh, for instance, there has been a 390% rise in attacks against water infrastructure inside of the United States in the last six years. So uh, they've already been planning for things. Uh, obviously, not everything's perfect, uh, but they're constantly planning constantly doing. And there's also one major difference. The uh, national level cert here in the United States is actually rather proactive. So they will try to proactively scan critical infrastructure and tell you, hey, you've got something real weak. All right, I've gotten those calls. And they're not great calls. But the EU cert does not do that. That is not their role. So they leave that up to individual countries. So again, I like Albania, but they do not have a mature search, so they cannot react or do something proactively. So what happens if they are the weak point in the system to penetrate into our European Union network? And so these are concerns that we have and I brought up because we need to address them. Any other questions? I got one. Oh yeah, finally, <laughs> finally. <laughs> What do you think about active measures, perception management campaigns? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, um, when, I, uh, when I first started at Aramco, I uh, proposed a spear phishing attack but using uh, one of the executives and I allowed uh, our managing director to pick the executive. And uh, that person was only given the information and it made them extremely aware of how very high value targets, whales we like to call them, uh, can be vulnerable and can bring that vulnerability into our company. And we did not want what happened in 2012, which could have raised gasoline prices up to $450 per barrel if Aramco had been shut down. They supply 25% of the world's energy one way or another. And Qatar was also affected at the same time with a variant of the virus. They supply about 14%. So that's the reason. Any other questions? So I think I still have time. I don't have my.
So, uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for a good talk, it's really interesting. Uh, I was interested in knowing what the general level of preparedness was for the participants. Did any of them have any strategies on how to deal with these situations in advance? Some do, uh, absolutely. So some of the countries like the United Kingdom or the Netherlands or Germany, France or so forth, they've got much more mature models, uh, much more mature strategy and military as well. And they also have the legislation available to them. Uh, other countries do not have those capabilities. And that's one of the things that was hi highlighted, a key highlight of why we need to work together more because if one falls, the rest can fall. Um, so some came in at very high level, some, what's a computer, right? <laughs> I don't use one of those. I just use the you know, government issued whatever phone. I don't touch that stuff. So yeah, it was a big mix. Hi. Um, I guess a two. I guess two questions. Um, one is, what sort of time constraints were they working on, and how did they handle it? And then the second question is more around. You talked about the lessons learned. So some, you know, things are about like lack of preparedness, things like that, or the ability to collaborate. Um, what are the next steps for that? And um, sort of talk about that. Would be great. Thanks. Okay. I remember. So, start with the second part. Um, basically, they had one full day to go over scenario one and scenario two, and then scenario three was an entire full day. So we're very lucky to actually get them for you know both days. Um, there were obviously some time constraints because on day one we had my presentation to basically warm them up and introduce and then some networky, you know, bits and pieces. Uh, but the time constraints were actually pretty good. They worked pretty well with it, uh, which I was surprised. I really was. Um, the second part... Yes. So what is coming out of this is better legislation because not all the countries actually have cyber legislation. Also there is jurisdictional issues. So if an attack comes from one country, hop, hop, hop through various other countries to trace back to try to prove attribution, not, you don't cooperate yet completely within Europe. So they've now brought that to the European Union Parliament. Uh, I think actually next week or the week after they're going to be discussing it to uh, put up for a vote to deal with the jurisdictional things because you, you need that attribution because you really don't want to launch that rocket if you can't prove it because that would be a bad thing. So those are the things that are coming out of it. As well as there has been uh, discussions to include preparation and training in part of the 2% GDP spending uh, requirements uh, for a member of NATO to include that to then ramp up preparation. That's what we discussed at a NATO meeting in May. So that's what's coming out of all of this. And it's a good thing because there's funding available. So I'm actually quite positive. Any other questions? <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone.